My name is Shen Zhan. I'm your host today, together with my colleague Yong Qiang. Yeah, Yong Qiang. Where Where is Yong Qiang? Everybody, perhaps. Here, here. I'm here. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello. 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 A uh, one-hour session uh, at noon. Uh, we cover a lot, um, but well, we will read a poem together. Um, so at some point, uh, we have to mute everyone uh, because well, we just don't want uh, the voices interrupt each other. But you can read after me or read uh, together, um, and you can hear yourself and hear um, us reading. Um, and also, we will look into at least one etymology of a character um, so that well, we not only uh, practice the pronunciation, but actually would look at the writing part of Chinese language. Uh, and starting this fourth season, we, I, we also will select one object. Usually, it's an art object. Uh, to look at that's relevant to today's either poem or the theme or the period. So it's a lot to cover uh, for one hour. And also Yong Qiang, Lin Lao uh, prepared a game uh, at the end of the session. Uh, it's, it's, it's fun, but well, it's also an encouragement for everyone to, uh, to follow uh, closely. All right. So, all of this inevitably has uh, have to be very brief, and I am I have to admit I'm not a master of all the cultural and language aspects that we're going to cover. Uh, we are uh, we are perhaps only to scratch the surface, the very surface of uh, of the aspect. I know actually some of the participants maybe uh, are more of an expert in one or more aspects, whether it's like art or calligraphy or poetry or China's history or something. Um, but well, this we really hope that it serves as a, uh, a window, a very small window so that well, we can peek into the vast um, land or landscape of Chinese culture and language. Um, so I will get started, and if you have any questions, um, please feel free. I would encourage you to use the chat box. You can raise your questions or comments there, or welcome to email us. Uh, both Lin Lao Shi and I, we are, uh, our emails will be shared at the end of the session. Uh, the session will be recorded, and we um, put all of our sessions on, our, on China Institute's YouTube channel. So uh, if you're curious about our previous lunch and learn sessions, you can go to our uh, YouTube channel, it's all there. Okay, great. So I will start to share my screen. Today we are reading, ah, uh, sorry. I do not mean to share this. <laughs> Just one second. Oh dear. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. So Tintian, today we are going to read Tian Jing Sha Chu Si by Ma Zhi Yuan. So here we can see Ma Zhi Yuan, uh, his time next to the name. Um, we don't know much actually, uh, we don't know a lot of the author Ma Zhi Yuan. We only know um, for sure that he was and is still one of the greatest uh, playwrights of drama in Yuan Dynasty. Uh, that's uh, pretty much the majority of his time. Uh, he was born in 1255 and the Yuan Dynasty in China started 1271. And it's very much interesting uh, to look at that uh, dynasty and the Mongol Empire, which we will touch upon a little bit later. Um, so the translation is by Stephen Owen. Of course, well, he's one of the most well-known phonologists and especially on Chinese classical uh, poetry. Uh, we, we 
um, share his translation, but I also want to emphasize uh, translating poetry in general, and especially Chinese classical poetry is notoriously challenging and also personal. So translators uh, often depending on their personal preference will have different versions from time to time or from one translators to another, while well, it will be very different. Uh, I want to mention a uh, event actually at China Institute. Some of you attended this past Saturday uh, on site at China Institute or online. Uh, it's to celebrate a book launch. Um, in fact, a translation of students at China Institute studying from uh, our master Ben Wang uh, to translate Tang poetry. Uh, I would ask Lin Lao Shi to share a link to the blog that recaps the um, the event. So if you are interested in, you can uh, you can download the entire book, the e copy of it. It's called uh, Visions East and West, and each poem selected from Tang Dynasty, in fact, has at least three different versions of translation. Um, by the group of students that have been studying Chinese classical poetry for many semesters and years. All right, so for today, um, then I will jump right into um, demonstrate the reading of this poem. I would invite you again to uh, also look at the uh, translation. Uh, the, we don't have a lot of time to go word by word or line by line. Um, but we hope this uh, translation would at least uh, get the message across. So I will read the entire poem um, of its entirety, uh, and then we can go uh, into word by word, line by line, and we can uh, read together. But I just want Hello, to demonstrate so you can um, you can hear Hello, this the translation. Yeah. Uh, any questions at this point? All right, I would ask you if you have any questions, Lin Lao Shi is watching the chat box. So you can yeah, put your questions or comments in the chat box. All right, so here we go. Tian Jing Sha, Chiu Si. Ku Teng Lao Shu, Hun Ya. 小桥流水人家, it's a very short poem. In fact, the genre of this poem in Yuan Dynasty is called Chu. The title. Tian Jing Sha is in fact the title of the tune. And Qiu Si is the title of this particular poem written according to the tune that in Yuan Dynasty is called Qu. Some of you, and we also, um, for those who have been to previous lunch and learn sessions, we learned last. Last week, we learned Ci in Song Dynasty. That's around 10th to 12th century. Um, and Shi earlier in Tang Dynasty. Uh, that's around uh, 8th to 10th century. So in China, well, these are all different genres of classical Chinese poems. Um, but well, because well, they throve in different time of China's history, and we often associated these youngers to that particular dynasty. Uh, not to say that these youngers started in those time, but well, they throve in those time period. So typically we would say Tang Shi, Song Ci, and Yuan Qu. Now, let's get into each line. So for uh, those of you who are new, I will read twice 
The first time I will pause after each word, you may notice that this particular poem, actually, it's all for the first three lines, it's all just nouns put together. It's a list of nouns. There is no verb, there's no other preposition. Uh, it's the image, it's the nouns that's together building up this image uh, that Ma Zhiyuan, the author, wants to express. So I will pause after each word and uh, you and you can read after me, and then I will read the entire line and pause. Um, so here we go. Ku Tang Lao Shu Hun Ya Ku Tang Lao Shu Hun Ya Xiao Chiao Liu Shui Ren Jia Xiao Chiao Liu Shui Ren Jia Gu Dao Now starting from this line, we can feel the change of the rhythm. Xi Yang Xi Xia. Xi Yang Xi Xia. Duan Chang Ren. Zai. Tian Ya. Duan Chang Ren. Zai Tian Ya. That's the entire poem. So now we can read this poem in its entirety together. I will start from the top and pause after each line. Tian Jing Sha Chiu Si Ku Tang Lao Shu Hun Ya Xiao Chiao Liu Shui Ren Jia Gu Dao Xi Feng Shou Ma Xi Yang Xi Xia Duan Chang Ren Zai Tian Ya And maybe a little challenge for reading without pinyin. All right, let's go together. Tian Jing Sha. Chiu Si Ma Zhi Yuan Ku Tang Lao Shu Hun Ya Xiao Chiao Liu Shui Ren Jia Gu Dao Xi Feng Shou Ma Xi Yang Xi Xia Duan Chang Ren Zai Tian Ya All right. 
So this poem, yeah, unlike Song Ci, the Ci poem that we shared one last week, no, sorry, last month in September. Um, in addition to the title of the tune, Tian Jing Sha, because there could be many poems written according to this tune. That means, well, the poet has to follow the rhyme, the structure, and also all the other regulations that's defined by the tune to create this um, poet poem. Well, in addition to that, because well, when you look at the song ci, it's just the title of the tune. Typically, there's uh, there's not a specific title for a ci, but for yuan shu, for this one, there is a title that's specifically indicating the theme that at least Ma Zhiyuan attempted to express uh, 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 with this poem. So this title, this theme is particularly related to the season of autumn. That's one reason we chose this poem to read together. Uh, I perhaps I would ask Lin Lao Shi to unmute everyone uh, as well. We are looking at both Chinese and English version of this poem. Uh, so if you have any questions or um, I want to ask by looking at this poem um, from personally, because well, poetry could be so personal. Do you feel the connection that well, it's what it's expressed is related to how you feel about autumn? Anyone wants to share? Things are dying. Things are dying. Yep. Yeah. That's a depressing poem. <laughs> but does that make you feel about uh, autumn? Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, um, it, it makes me feel about, uh, think about uh, the dynasty, the Yuan dynasty, the Mongolian dynasty. Hmm, how so? Um, probably the the poet expresses the um, the sadness about the this dynasty ruling. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a that's a very um, interesting and also important um, observation of that. Because well, uh, I later actually will go into that very quickly um, because. We know Ma Zhiyuan uh, is a Chinese, was a Chinese. Um, but during Yuan Dynasty, the, ru the rulers are not, were not Chinese, but Mongols. So there could be a line joined by how he, Ma Zhiyuan, felt about his living or entire situation and that kind of sadness uh, to be expressed, not directly, but indirectly through this poem. Um, but also I want to share a comment. I think, uh, I think it was a Zhang who shared that the sadness uh, of uh, autumn, because this, this theme is often the sadness, the melancholy is often associated with uh, the season autumn in China. And it's not just started from Ma Zhiyuan. Uh, if you have read many of the poems that's about autumn in China, you could really find a happy and uplifting uh, example. And in fact, in the Warring State, uh, that was about uh, almost 400, 500 BC, uh, a poet in China, Song Yu, uh, one of his most famous um, poem was about uh, the sadness of uh, the season, autumn, that almost started this tradition of that kind of association that, well, even though autumn could be so glorious, you see the colors, you see the maturity of the vegetation, of the 
um, of the fruits of the crops in the field, but it's also the time that everything will decline inevitably. That's the cycle of the nature. So that makes people uh, feel and associate this kind of sadness uh, in it. So with that, um, I want to perhaps we'll focus a little bit more on the theme because well, it's, we looked at the etymology of Chiu last time and the second character, Si, is, what does it mean? Well, if you can remember the English part, right? Thoughts. Thoughts. Yes. So if we look at the etymology part of this, this si is what will we see today. This is a simplified version, but this version actually has existed uh, for a long time. We, some of us will, we probably know that the simplified characters was a movement um, in like early 1950s in mainland China, in other parts uh, like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, or outside of mainland China, traditional Chinese characters uh, are still commonly used. But if we go back to like more than 2000, almost 2000 years ago, this is what si looks like. There are two parts, even in the simplified version, we can easily see there are two parts. There's the top part that looks like, well, it's actually in simplified character, it's a, a character on its own, tian, like the field. And the bottom part is, I know some of you must know this, right? Part, of course. Xin, Xin. So like what's thought or to think, whether that has anything to do with the field and we can relate directly to the heart, right? But if we look at this part, the top part is actually not Tian. And what image do you think it represents? The bottom part is actually a more I would say uh, accurate or description, descriptive version of a, a heart. The top part actually represents, um, if we have a bird's view of humans top of the head, the skull, especially when like a baby, when, when, when the baby is newly born, there is a part that at the center of the skull is still open and soft. Font fontanelle. Right. right, thank you. I don't have an English word for that. I think that's so the this, word. This, this character is actually representing that part. It's representing the top of the skull. And mm -hmm. that image, of course, well, would make us think that it's related to the head, the mind. And then bottom part is, yeah, well, you can even see the different com um, compartments of, of the heart and uh, even the vine that's related to the heart. So when, and, and this version, um, I put the date there. It's the date of um, a, 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 a scholar called Xu Shen, and he wrote Shuo Wen Jie Zi. That's literally the first book in China um, dissecting the characters and looking into the etymology of the characters at that time. Mm -hmm. That's during Han Dynasty, Eastern Han Dynasty. So it's literally close to um, uh, 2000 years, uh, a short of 2000 years, but still very long time. So uh, I, I think this could be a fun act exercise uh, that uh, I brought my travel brush pen. And I would invite you, if you have any pen or paper, 
Uh, maybe we can write this character together. Uh, you don't have to have a calligraphy brush uh, or a, a, I, I, I bought this actually here in New York. Uh, it's, um, it has a plastic soft uh, sort of brush at the tip of this pen and it's easy to travel. Uh, so I would actually ask Lin Lao Shi to help me put to the other camera. We have a writing pad here, so you can see how uh, I'm trying to, uh, in fact, draw this picture myself, right? Uh, Lin Lao Shi, maybe I have to stop share for a bit. And then Lin Lao Shi, can you bring the other? I send the request oh, okay. to start radio. I, uh, oh, can you send the request again, please? Oh, right. Ah. Okay, so uh, I Okay, so here is the, the pen, which is quite short. It's like a, it's hard, it, it, it's easy to control. Um, and then with this pen. So let's uh, maybe, I will start with the, the ancient one. Uh, I hope everyone can see it clearly. It really is like drawing a picture. And let's finish the top of the skull. Yeah, I think I think this is a little too round actually, but it represents the image. And then the starting of the heart. I will start from the left. There's a little short vertical line and then go around. Please write it larger. Oh, okay. I will fit. I will finish this one and see how to do how to do it larger. Mm. Uh, it's a small brush pen. Maybe oh. next time I will bring a real brush. <laughs> and then I will do the other part, the right one. And then there's this spine. Yeah. And then finish the last part. There you go. Hmm. Okay. So I will bring it closer. Can you see it? Hmm. Yeah. All right. Maybe I will try a bigger one. And this time I will make the top part a little bit more square. Okay. Top. And then, by the way, this is just me drawing according to the how I see the character. Actually, in the art of calligraphy, uh, writing the oracle bone style or mm -hmm. the seal style is, um, is, is on itself, um, has its own techniques and its own regulations. If anyone is interested in or is an expert, please share. <laughs> But I myself really enjoy, this is almost like a meditative and artistic exercise for myself. Um, not only writing this, but even like writing in general um, mm -hmm. by hand. And then this. I'm sure you have your own 
version of this. Oh, mm -hmm. xie xie, Xiaoan. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. All right, so maybe we can do a simplified version of this. That's quite different. Uh, yeah, I can see Elisa is asking a question like the, the, the direction of the strokes. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, for this particular style, I do not know, um, but I can look into that and perhaps I can share more next time. I know most of Chinese, even in China nowadays, it's more of the simplified version that I'm starting right now. Um, but in general, the rule is you start from the top to bottom, from left to right. The first part of this I started sort of, because it's almost like a round, uh, there's really no direction or necessarily side to start with. But in simplified character, it's much more like a square. At one point uh, in China's history, actually it's around, I think, well, Han Dynasty. There is a movement that's um, transforming the characters more from an image with uh, a lot of different like curves and round that kind of shapes more of a picture uh, to a square uh, characters with straight uh, strokes. So that's how today we see Chinese characters, whether it's simplified or traditional version, uh, it's more like a square. It's nothing really um, exactly like a picture anymore. So this is the first stroke of the simplified version. And then we have these. And then Hung and Shu. Usually close whatever square last. And then for Xin, we start from the left. to the right. Yeah, this is, well, the Tian, the top part is a little too big. It's like a, a child with too big head. <laughs> yeah, but that, that, that's me at this moment. <laughs> All right, so that's a little writing exercise for today. Uh, now, well, if you want to share your version, welcome uh, to show us, or you can, thank you, <laughs> Xiao An. All right, so Yong, Yong Chang, maybe we can stop spotlighting this one. Yeah, uh, stop. Thank you. And let's go back to the, PowerPoint, and just to share. Yeah. So as some of you already making that connection with the Mongol rulers during Yuan Dynasty for Chinese. Uh, next, I just want to quickly go through this time period because uh, it's also important to understand our um, poet Ma Zhiyuan's time. As we know, some of us know, uh, Mongols, especially uh, Genghis Khan, well, he really was the one who started establishing this massive Mongol empire. This is the map by the time of his death, 1227, uh, that starting from Mongolia, it's um, the, the Mongols are, were ruling pretty much from the east to the west, uh, the majority part of the continent. But we can see here, well, the Song Dynasty is still not entirely, the Song Empire was not entirely under the rule, the ruling of Mongols. 
Um, this, it's actually called the Southern Song Dynasty that the, the empire lost its northern part, but well, with the natural protection of Yangtze River, uh, they were um, able to still preserve um, for another uh, 100 years to, um, to keep the Song Dynasty, but with much limited and also much weaker political power. It is, or it was, until um, Kublai Khan, uh, that was Genghis Khan's grandson in 1221, that the Southern Song was uh, actually taken over by the Mongols. So the entire Yuan Dynasty in China completed its, uh, its, its territory. Uh, but we know uh, the one of the most famous Westerners traveling to China was also during this time. I know you must know. Marco Polo. Go the In Chinese, we just phonetically translating his name, Marco Polo, Marco Polo. Well, as I was preparing for this, I was, uh, I was also looking into refreshing my memory of his story. It's just fascinating. Uh, and of course, while well, there are debates about whether or to what extent uh, his legend or the stories that he shared his book in his book uh, are actually true. But um, I tend to believe, well, and also just like well, by uh, listening to some of the comments of his, the details and everything, it's just fascinating whether it's, uh, it's figurative or, uh, or it's, it's real. Uh, we talked about the Silk Road uh, in past sessions a little bit. Uh, we, we know Silk Road is not one road and it's not just about silk, but rarely uh, we have anyone who can actually follow the Silk Road from the beginning to the end. It's usually the, uh, the travelers or the merchants will uh, really um, more active from uh, in one sector and then passing the goods or the, 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 the cultures or, or things uh, to the next sector and then pass on to that. So Marco Polo's story is really well from Venice to, uh, to Beijing, but that's the, uh, uh, the, the current day name, right? At the Yuan Dynasty, it's called Da Du. So all of these amazing travels that he, uh, he, he passed on was just uh, fascinating. Uh, but what I want to share is, um, it's really, it's the only, it's, well, in world history, it's during Mongol Empire that the entire continent uh, was under one ruler and it was united. So that kind of political and social unity provided these opportunities for the cultures from the very East to the West and vice versa, all these regions to be able to um, have in a much more open uh, environment to develop, to exchange. Uh, so if there's one object, which is very hard to choose just one to share uh, today, I want to uh, focus on, oh, this, this map is just showing, well, the Mongol empire was vast, but also was very brief. And in the end, after the death of Kublai Khan, it was divided into four major parts. And the, uh, the part that uh, China was, or uh, uh, what current day China was, was mostly uh, situated was uh, taken over by Ming Dynasty, Ming Empire, uh, and then other parts eventually dissolved into other dynasties. Uh, but if one object I want to focus, uh, I want to, well, I know many of you also uh, perhaps have seen this and or even maybe very familiar with, um, that is the white and blue porcelain. In Chinese, we call this Qinghua. 
And remember this character, Qing. We actually looked into the etymology last session, the blue greenish color, um, but also really uh, not just the color. Chinese love this character for the reason that it's associated with, with liveliness, with lush, with um, the kind of elegance that this porcelain, this object uh, represents as well. So this, this one is, is at the mat. Actually, the, I think it, 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 I chose this one because it really is a good representation of the cultural exchange that the Mongol Empire encouraged during that time. Not only in blue and white, oftentimes are associated with Islamic culture and very popular in Central and Western Asia. Uh, the material, the cobalt blue, uh, was majority uh, coming from outside of China. Mm -hmm. And many of this blue and white, this Qinghua Ci, Ci is porcelain. Qinghua Ci during Yuan Dynasty were made for uh, customers uh, outside of China. So if you go to uh, museums in China right now, uh, there are very, uh, not that many, Qinghua from Yuan Dynasty. But if you go to Istanbul, for example, perhaps you would be able to find more than what you can find in, uh, in China of Qinghua from Yuan Dynasty. So this one also, if you look closely at the design, while well, these on the shoulder, this is a design called um, cloud color. It's very popular um, on textiles of Mongols, as well as popular in Islamic culture. And the body actually are peony, which very typically in Chinese culture representing luxury, wealth, being glorious. And the bottom is actually the petals of lotus. So would remind us that while Buddhism at that time was thriving in China and but he originally coming from India. So just by looking at the design of this itself is already an integration of pretty much uh, many different cultures and a, a, a great example of globalization at that time. But I have to say, in fact, uh, Yuan Dynasty was not when this kind of blue and white uh, porcelain started. Uh, it, it probably started in Tang Dynasty. This one from Yangzhou Museum uh, is from Tang Dynasty. Now very rare, but it was discovered uh, from different sites. And there was a famous um, uh, ship sunk in India Ocean, actually uh, carried a lot of the, um, the Tang Dynasty uh, blue and white porcelain um, as part of a trade between China and, uh, and other parts of the world. But Yuan Dynasty, uh, due to the techniques, the skills, and the demand from other parts of China of this uh, Qinghua Ci, uh, it really uh, developed to its peak. Um, so this brilliant example from uh, Cleveland Museum uh, really also tells that kind of story. And we can see um, the design is pretty similar, even though the shape. Also, there, there are line heads here. But it, I, when I'm looking at this one, I also sort of like thinking, well, lines were not originally or locally in China. So the image that would, uh, of lines would appear on a jar uh, in Yuan Dynasty, it's already of uh, hundreds of years of cultural exchange, and that's the proof of it. Um, of course, by Ming and Qing Dynasty, after the discovery by Portuguese um, of the Qinghua Ci to the Europe, European market, it became hugely popular. Uh, the, uh, the uh, well, not only in, Port uh, in Portugal, but also uh, France, um, uh, Germany, and well, many other 
regions and countries in Europe. This one also from the mat, uh, I find it, it's fascinating too. Uh, just by a glance, the design looks pretty much like the other designs, blue and white with very sophisticated patterns. Um, but if you look closely, these are, these are actually representing um, symbols for the Portuguese royal arms. Uh, these symbols actually pretty much associated with the Portugal's, um, the royal arms. Uh, and this one, these letters, was the early, uh, it's, it's, well, it's well known in, in, at, um, uh, during that time to representing uh, Jesus Christ. So there are uh, pretty much also uh, a mixture of different culture, cultural elements in this. And this is of course more made in China um, for the Portuguese market. Yeah, that's a little very brief repre uh, uh, presentation of culture and language all together. Um, we are running out of time for any breakout session, but I do want to invite uh, Lin Lao Shi to, uh, to share the game so that uh, we can all play together. Okay, so should we start now or read the poem together one time? So if we don't have the breakout room. Yeah, 好的, 那我们, mm -hmm. all right, that's a great suggestion. So perhaps we can read the poem together. We can unmute ourselves and just get as noisy as possible. <laughs> I will bring the poem up. All right. Are we ready? Well, you can, I would invite you to unmute yourself so I can hear you and well, we can read each other, uh, we can read together. If, yeah, if we don't, um, the echo doesn't interrupt if. All right, okay, let's do this together. Yeah, it does have some kind of echo. Yeah, uh, unfortunately. But we can still read uh, together. Tian so just be careful this xia, it's going down. I want to emphasize it's important because well, if you hear this is ya, jia, it's going up and keep the pitch high up there. And then starting from ma, xia, so you can hear the musical part of it. It's the yi yang dun cuo, the ups and downs that makes this qi musical. Xi yang xi xia. Xi yang xi xia. Xi yang xi xia. Duan chang ren zai tian ya. Duan chang ren zai tian ya. Now I will stop sharing and Lin Lao Shi can share your game. Yes, okay, it's my turn. Just uh, one minute. Okay. So for the game, you need your phone. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, let me see. It's a little bit like a pop up quiz, but <laughs> it's a fun pop up quiz. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Great, great. Mm -hmm. 
and this time. All right, so now, so everybody can see the screen, right? So on your phone, please open your browser uh, and then type in the, the URL, the www.kahoot.it. And then you will be prompt to enter the pin, which is on the screen. I can see people are coming in now. Mm -hmm. So we have four. So you can uh, later you will see the question and the answer uh, in my screen. So in my share screen, and you have to answer it on your phone. Just <coughs> use the same color to answer it on your phone. Marilyn, <laughs> Well, if you want, we can you can stay after this for a few minutes. We can we can see how to help you. <laughs> so we will have few questions to have fun to answer. And all the answers will be from the lessons you just learned. <laughs> it's very easy, but the uh, the score you have you will uh, have will be inflected by the answer how is correct and also the speed how quickly you answer it. Okay, let's just do it. <laughs> oh, we have fifteen. So can we start now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Get ready. You have 30 seconds to answer this one. It's very easy. Who is the first empress of Yuan Dynasty? Hey, we go. Oh, oh, say, yeah, she who be there, crippling hand. So, uh, he is this, uh, how was I have to say, who is the first emperor to start use Yuan as the name of it? Uh, his. Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty. But the first one, King uh, uh, his Khan. King his Khan is the, uh, the emperor or the king of the uh, Mongolian, not the Yuan Dynasty. That's mm. a little tricky. <laughs> a little tricky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say I didn't mention that. Uh, uh, like, I didn't emphasize that in the talk. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, the right answer is Yuan Chu because it's from Yuan Dynasty and uh, it's Yuan Chu. Right? Oh, damn, that's the E. How many objects you can count in this poem? So I would say the last sentence, Duan Chang Ren, Zai Tian Ya. Tianya would be one, and Duan Changren would be one too. Mm. 
the heartbreaking people is one object, and the far horizon is one object too. Good, 很好，十二个 ，Yeah. So you will start from the beginning. We will say 十二个 So 夕阳西下，夕阳西下 is the one. So it's 夕阳 the sunset sun. Yes, one object. So it's 十二个好，看看谁第一啊、oh, ？Teresa 是第一。下一个。很简单，很简单。快一点，快一点，快一点，快快快！快一点，快一点，还有一个。哈哈哈哈哈 ！That should be very easy for you. So it's s t o Thoughts. S. OK. 好，我们来看看现在是谁。啊 ，Teresa 还是第一。第五个。Pay attention. Which place was not included? Good, 非洲 African no, yeah, 亚洲亚洲 Asia, 欧洲 Europe. 好，下一个，看看现在是谁？哦、oh, ，还是 Teresa. 很好。Yeah, I remember Shen Zhan Lao. She mentioned this. Which city did Marco Polo meet the Yuan Emperor? So I use the current name. Yeah, Beijing. Beijing is the capital of Yuan Dynasty. So which is Beijing now? Beijing. Eleven people. Eleven people. Wow, Sam, come back. Just true or false? So, Qinghua Ci first produced in Yuan Dynasty. True or false? Yeah, 不对不对 Yeah, shouldn't be right because it started from we can say it started from Tang Dynasty at least, and but the Yuan Dynasty is a very important period for. Yeah, I think that's it. Let's see. Teresa, 第三名，然后第二名是 Teresa， 第二名，第一名呢？三，恭喜恭喜！祝贺，呃，小安 Maria the runner ups <laughs>。Yeah, how the oh okay, I stop sharing now. Yeah, I think our our time is up for today. Hope you enjoy the session, and we look we look forward to see all of you next. Session in November, so please do register、um, for next one. Because well, yeah, because of the system is just like doesn't allow anyone to just automatically register for all the sessions. So you have to go to our website and do that separately. But it really is great to see all of you here. Yeah. All right. 好的，谢谢大家，祝大家周末愉快，再见，再见，再见，谢谢。